G'day, this is Chris Savage from Our Real Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Acts. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your growth. Thank you. Today we're looking at Acts chapter 17, verse 1, verse 21. Last week, uh, we see four men, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Barnabas, uh, set off for Philippi. Uh, they were the first, that's the first European city that they're heading to. Um, because of that vision, no, there was no synagogue there when they got there. Uh, sorry, they got to um, uh, Philippi and no synagogue there. So they headed down to the banks of um, the river uh, where they would meet, where the Jews would meet on the Sabbath if, if there was no synagogue. So that they down there at the river bank. And there's a, there's a prayer meeting down there because that's what the Jews do when there's no synagogue. Um, and so uh, the group meet down there with a, with a, a big group of women. And during the conversation, uh, one, one of the women called Lydia, um, I remember it was a man in the vision who called, called Paul across to uh, Macedonia, but the first convert is Lydia, a woman. Um, she's converted. She's, uh, and, uh, after hearing the conversation with Paul and, and the group. And uh, now she, in, in, well, she encourages, she pretty much forcibly tells these guys that they're going to stay with them in, in her house. And during the mission, during the mission there in Philippi, we have a young maid also with a spirit of divination. Remember that Pythian spirit? And uh, she kept following the group for days. And she continually cried out that these men are servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. But you know, after a few days of this, Paul had enough of it and he told the spirit to get out of the, out of the young maid. The spirit did. Problem now is that her masters have now lost their source of income and they're not happy. So they dragged Paul and Silas off to the magistrates and what happened there was a bit of a trumped up charge and they get beaten with rods and, and they get cast into jail. Paul gets beaten with rods, cast into jail. And they're in, in this uh, inner prison inside the prison with, with stocks on, chained up. And uh, what were Paul and Silas doing that night? Singing and praising God in prison, in this dungeon. What happens now is there's an earthquake hits and uh, the doors are flung wide open, the chains, uh, the shackles are loosed. The jailer thinks that they've escaped, he's about to kill himself and Paul yells out, hey, we're all here, mate, don't worry about that. So what happens? And so now we see with the jailer, you know, Paul's just saved his physical life and the jailer now says, you know, what must I do to be saved? spiritually virtually and uh, so paul shares the gospel with him uh, he comes to faith and and now his family also believe they come to faith they get baptized remember they're still in prison they're still prisoners but now the magistrates the next day they decide oh you know we're gonna let paul go we're gonna let these men go so he, he, they send the sergeants down there to go and tell them they can go but Right, Paul and Silas, I said, not that easy, guys. You know, you, you threw us in prison without any charges. Uh, but guess what? We're Roman citizens. And that, that put the fear into the magistrates because uh, you, you, can be, you can be killed, you can be executed for beating a Roman citizen. So the magistrates now come down and beg, beg Paul and Silas to go. And so, you know, being very gracious, they head back to Lydia's house. And what do they do? They encourage the brethren there because of, you know, because they've been persecuted. They encourage the brethren there to keep on with it. And uh, we see now that a church was planted in Philippi. And uh, now we see that Luke stays behind to pastor this church and the others head off to Thessalonica. And that's where we are today. We're going to head down to Thessalonica verses one to nine now when chapter 17 now when they had passed through amphipolis and polonia they came to thessalonica where was a synagogue of the jews and paul as his custom was went in unto them and for three sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures 
opening and alleging that it behooved the Christ to suffer and to rise again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom said he, I proclaim unto you, is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And some of them were persuaded and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, being moved with jealousy, took upon them certain vile fellows of the rabble, and gathering a crowd, set the city on an uproar. And assaulting the house of Jason, they sought to bring them forth to the people. When they found them not, they dragged Jason and certain brethren before the rulers of the city, saying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason has received, and these all act contrary uh, to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the multitude and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So the ministry in Thessalonica is given in these first nine verses. And verse one describes the journey itself when they passed through, um, when they passed through, they, they went, they journeyed from Philippi to Thessalonica. That's about a hundred miles. And they, there were two other places in between Amphipolis and Apollon, Apollonia. And about 30 mile intervals. Uh, this was along that Ignatian way or the Via Ignatian. And they passed through Amphipolis. Uh, that's about 32, 30 miles or so from Philippi, passed through there. Um, this is the capital of the first district of Macedonia. It was three miles inland from the sea. Why do they pass through? Because there was no synagogue there. There's no synagogue there, no Jewish community there. So Paul just simply passed through it. They need to stop. Next, they pass through Apollonia, which is about another 30 odd miles on from Amphipolis. And it's located along the, the Ignatian Way as well. Again, we find that there's no synagogue in Apollonia either, uh, no Jews there either. So, what do they do? They continued on, they pass through there as well. They then pass through Sethalaika, which is uh, modern. Today it's Saloniki in Syria, in Turkey, Saloniki in Turkey. Um, formerly it was also known as Therma because it was the head of the Thermaic Gulf. It was renamed by Cassandra in 313 BC after his wife. It just so happens that his wife was the stepsister of Alexander the Great. So it's about a hundred miles southwest of Philippi along the Ignatian Way. So it's 37 miles uh, west of Apollonia, and this became part, there's a bit of history here, became part of the Roman Empire in 168 BC, made a free city in 42 BC. Uh, check your slides because I think I had 142 BC. It had a people's assembly, uh, what they call a demos, and it had five or six leaders known as politarchs. Um, now, what happened was the Romans originally divided Macedonia into four districts. And what they did was they made Thessalonica the capital of the second district. Later on, um, this city uh, became the capital of all Macedonia, Thessalonica. Macedonia was redesigned as one province, which was, uh, became known as the province of Macedonia. And this place was a, was a center for business, rivaled only by Corinth. And it was located on, on several important trade routes, boasted an excellent harbor. Um, it was predominantly Greek, even though it was controlled by Rome. And by Paul's day, it had a population of around about 200,000 people. So it's a, it's a pretty fair-sized city. And in keeping with Romans 1.16, um, uh, we see what did, what did he do? He goes to the Jew first. He went to the Jew first. So this city did have a synagogue because we see in verse one where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Uh, and the word is singular means only one synagogue in a city of 200,000. So even though it was a, a very populated city, the Jewish population was very small here because we only have one synagogue. And verse two 
Here's Paul's custom, or this is the custom that he, he had, and this is the custom he writes about in Romans. Then Paul, as his custom was, the custom, the custom here was based upon what was written or what he'd write in Romans 1.16, that the gospel was to be proclaimed to the Jew first. So Paul, as his custom was, went in unto them, the Jews, and he reasoned with them for three Sabbaths, which means at least for three weeks. It was the length of his ministry in the synagogue, uh, not in the city, but in the synagogue. And so what we see here is that, remember, remember Paul is a tent maker. He makes tents. Um, but uh, on the Sabbath day, he ministered in, in the Jewish synagogue where he knew that he would find both devout Jews and Gentiles and the uh, the, the, the Gentiles would be God seekers or, or, and proselytes. We don't exactly know how long Paul remained in Thessalonica, but it was long enough to, to receive financial help twice from the church back in Philippi. So it must have been a, a fair while that he, 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 uh, he was there. And we see that in Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, where he received that uh, financial aid from Philippi. Now, Paul reasoned with them, uh, and this is the first of several times that Luke uh, uses the word reason in the way, uh, in, in describing the way that Paul communicated the gospel to the Jewish people. Uh, and the Greek word for reasoning here means, it means to revolve in the mind, it, it means to converse with an interchange of ideas, so there's dialogue going on, it's a, it's it's teaching a, in a dialectic method where you have questions and answers, and this is this is very typical of, of the Jewish way of, of of teaching questions and answers. Um, so it's described, it's descriptive here of Paul's approach to this Jewish community. So he proclaimed that the gospel to them by means of discussion, and and he discussed by means of questions and answers. Yeah, you know that the. Uh, Arnold tells us a little story about, you know, the, 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 uh, the minister says to the Jewish rabbi, he says, you know, why do you guys always keep asking questions? And the Jewish rabbi says, well, why not? You know, so they're always asking questions. Questions are the best way to learn. Now, it says this reasoning, how did he reason? It was done from the scriptures because the scriptures were the source of Paul's evidence. That's where he got his evidence from the scriptures. And the scriptures are the basis for proving the messiahship of Jesus. So he's reasoning with them from the scriptures. That's where he's getting his, 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 uh, his basis from. And in verse 3, we have the content of his message. It says, opening and alleging. When it says opening, it, it's referring to the scriptures. So he's, he opened up the scriptures, meaning, what does it mean? It doesn't mean he, he opened the Bible. It, it means he he explained or he expounded uh, the meaning of the scriptures. And this is the same thing that Jesus did back in, in Luke 24, uh, 32 and, and 24, 45. Jesus and Paul just explained what the scriptures meant. And the word alleging here means he was propounding the truth. He, he, was, he, was, he was proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. And this would naturally follow opening or expanding on the text. And that's what he was doing. And that's what we should be doing too. So what he, what he expanded or what he alleged was the gospel. It says that it behooved the Christ to suffer. And this was the major premise that the Messiah had to suffer. He had to be crucified. And this suffering included the death on the cross, the death of the Messiah. You know, the death of the Messiah was the major issue to prove from the scripture because, remember, the cross was a stumbling block to the Jews. Uh, they couldn't come up with the fact that, uh, you know, the Messiah could be crucified. It was a stumbling block. And he also had to prove that the Messiah had to rise from the dead. So that's the minor premise. Major premise, Christ had to die. Minor premise, he rose from the dead. And here's two parts of the gospel. Christ died, Christ rose. And the point here, the point here is that this Jesus, whom said he, I proclaim unto you, is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Literally, it says, this is the Messiah, 
Jesus who I am proclaiming to you. And this is the conclusion of Paul's line of argument. What he's saying is that these scriptures which speak of a suffering and rising Messiah are fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. That's what he's propounding from the scriptures. That's what he's alleging from the scriptures. So Paul's approach here, uh, and, and so should ours be, it should be, it was that he, he reasoned from the scriptures, he explained the scriptures, and then he proved from the scriptures that this Jesus is the Messiah, and then he proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah. He set before, he set before them one Old Testament proof after another, that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Uh, and if you remember, this is what Jesus did to those disciples on the Emmaus Road. It says he opened up the scriptures. He opened up the law, the writings, and the prophets. So he, he, Jesus has explained from the scriptures why he was the Messiah. Same thing that Paul's doing here. Uh, and Paul was very careful to announce or, or to preach the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the message of the gospel. We see that in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and, and onward. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, I think it is. It is. Now, after three Sabbath ministry, that's, you know, Sabbath is every Saturday. So after three of them, in verse 4, we see the positive results of this. First of all, amongst the Jews, it says, some of them were persuaded. So among the Jews of Thessalonica, uh, some were persuaded that Jesus is the Messiah, and they believed. And this included a, a man called Aristarchus, uh, and we're going to see him in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, and in Colossians 4.10. It also included another a Jewish man called Secundus, and again, we'll see him in Acts 24, 20, verse 4, when we get there. So these Jews who believed were uh, consorted or were working along with now with Paul and Silas. So this small group of Jews who believed were given to Paul and Silas by lot, by God's grace. And second, uh, who else did, did Paul win here? He also won Gentiles to the Lord. It says, and the devout Greeks. So these are the Gentiles, or the God-fearers, uh, the proselytes of the gate. Uh, and it says a great multitude. It wasn't just a couple of them. It was a great multitude. So in other words, what we see here is that the majority of the people who believed here were Gentiles. So both Jews, a small number, and Gentiles, the majority, now believe because of Paul's uh, preaching and his preaching method, you know, uh, questions and answers. And so now we have a, a large group here. Um, and we have also now women believed as well. And because not just any order women, it says the chief women or, or the women of the upper classes also believed. So these women were also proselytes, uh, as those we find back in Acts chapter 13, verse 50. And it says not a few. Uh, what, what that means, it, it, it indicates that there was a, a great number of women also believed. So this is a, this is a, this is a big church now. Uh, the number was not a few, but it was a great, it was a big crowd of believers. And uh, the gospel message was received by, by people of various nationalities and, and various social positions. And uh, we know from First and Second Thessalonians uh, that, that uh, there's a gap of time uh, between verses 4 and 5. Uh, because between verses 4 and 5, other things take place. And, and you find it in First and Second Thessalonians. Okay, so between the success of the ministry in verse 4 and the opposition in verses 5 to 9, other things happened. A lot more happened, which Luke didn't bother to write here. Um, so we see the other stuff in first and second. This. But guess what? You know, not everybody was happy about these results. Hey, you know, it, out of the Jewish synagogue, you know, uh, devout Jews, uh, sorry, the Jews and devout Greeks and, and chief women, they're believing in this Messiah that Paul and Silas are preaching about. So there's a, there's a section within that uh, synagogue that they're not happy. And in verses 5 to 9, we now have the opposition. Uh, what happens now is that the mob gets stirred up. 
And it says, but the Jews moved with jealousy. So the Jewish community here is the source of the opposition. And here we have the true reason for the opposition, and it was jealousy. They simply became jealous over the success that Paul was having among the Gentiles. Because Gentiles are turning to this new way, this gospel, the good news. Now, he did make his fellow Jews jealous, but the, you know, the, but the jealousy that he wants them to have is that the Gentiles have found faith in the Jewish Messiah. But that's not the jealousy that we see here. They're simply jealous because Paul's more popular than they are. And, and verse 5 here is the background to what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 to 16, where he says that they forbid us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, and they drove us out. So that's what the Jews did here to Paul and, uh, and Silas. They forbid them to speak to the Gentiles and then uh, they drove them out. How did they do it? It says they took onto them certain vile fellows of the rabble. Now the Greek word agor, agor, agorias for rabble is used only here and again in Acts 19.38. It comes from the Greek word agora, that means marketplace. And because the marketplace here was a gathering place for those who had nothing to do, you know, you get into the marketplace, see what trouble you can get up to down there. And so these were, these guys were rabble rousers, which were pretty common in Greek and Roman societies. And they tended to gravitate around a rostrum. And what they did was they applauded or they heckled according to the to the desire of the one who paid them so you know you want to have you want to you want to have a political a political rally you know we'll just pay we'll just pay a bunch of people to heckle you all the way through uh, cicero called them the sub rostrani which literally means those under the rostrum these guys were bad men <laughs> these were the bad men among the marketplace uh, and these were Gentiles. Gentiles were used here in the opposition. So the Jews gathered a crowd. And so they gathered this crowd up. They manufactured now a riot to get the attention of the magistrates. So the riot then began in the marketplace with Paul. And now the entire city now gets into an uproar. <laughs> uh, uh, what it means when it says they got into uproar, it means that they kept up this, they kept up this uh, uproar. I kept it going. We, we need to attract as much attention as we can. And in, in, in second part of verse five and first part of verse six, we see the attack upon Jason and assaulting the house of Jason, they sought to bring them forth to the people. So they, they attacked Jason. They rushed to the house, this mob. And the reason was that Jason was Paul's host on this occasion. So Paul was staying at the house of Jason and they sought to bring Paul and Silas out to the people. Who are they after? They're after Paul and Silas. They weren't after Jason. Um, and they burst into the house and they searched up and down inside the house. When they, when they couldn't find Paul and Silas, what did they do? They dragged Jason and certain other brethren uh, before the rulers of the city. And when they burst into the house, they realized that Paul and Silas were not present. So they dragged these guys outside. Okay. And they drag him before the rulers of the city. And uh, these are the Polytarchs. Um, it's, a, it's a Macedonian name for the Polytarchs. Uh, and we see this in the Greek literature also in, in second century BC. Um, now, the reason I say that is because it's, it's showing Luke's accuracy in writing. You know, he uses the, the right terminology uh, for this period of time. Uh, and also, it's, uh, these, this term was found by archaeologists on an inscription on the Volga Gate. Uh, and so it was the correct title for the city's offices of Thessalonica. Uh, and these polytarchs were also called burgomasters or the rulers of the city. Burgomasters. Now, in six to seven, we have the accusations. Uh, 
it says they're a crime. Um, uh, the Greek is, is uh, boao means more than it. It means they were yelling and screaming. They weren't just crying, they were yelling and screaming. And the charge that they bring against Paul and Silas is, is first of all, oh, sorry, uh, against Jason here, is that they accuse, uh, they accuse Paul and Silas of turning the world upside down. These guys are disturbing the peace. Uh, and these guys who've been turning the world upside down, they've come here into our city as well. And uh, where it says world here uh, in the Greek, it's, it, it means the inhabited world. It really uh, probably in this context simply means the Roman Empire um, because this was a political charge here. So they're clearly accusing Paul and Silas of disturbing the peace. And since it was Jason and not Paul and Silas that they'd brought forward, they had to say something about Jason. So what do they say? They simply accuse Jason of complicity in this, uh, in this uprising. Um, because, uh, because, you know, Jason entertained them. Jason was looking after them. Second charge here was treason against Rome. Now, this is a bit more serious here. Treason against Rome. And how do we know that? Because it says... It's, it says, these all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar. So this now is treason. Um, and probably the decrees of Caesar they had in mind were what, what is called the, the Julian Legs Majestas, Majestatis. Um, and this was a law. And this law forbid anyone from proselytizing Roman citizens. And... Uh, also, they accused these men of saying that there was another king, Jesus. So what, what the, the charge is now is that these men are, are, you know, are, are preaching treason against Caesar because now they're, they're, they're talking about another king, another king, his name is Jesus. So this made Jesus a competitor to Caesar. And so they would be guilty of treason here, um, where it says uh, where it says another king here. It means uh, another of a different kind in the Greek. Uh, that is a king uh, unlike Caesar. This king is a different kind of king, not 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 like Caesar. The kingship of Jesus Christ is unlike that of the rulers of this world. Anyway, it's neither political nor is it of this world. So no threat as for Jesus as being a competitor to Caesar here. And the results we see in verse eight is that they troubled or they agitated two groups. And so the crowd, first of all, agitated the multitude. They stirred the multitude up. And for the multitudes, this meant a revolution. And second, they also agitated the rulers of the city. Why? Because the, for the politarchs, it meant a charge of complicity in treason if they allowed this to, to happen, if they allowed this to pass under their watch. And that's why they were troubled when they heard these things. Uh, they don't want to be charged of complicity in treason against Caesar. And in verse 9, the issue is settled now with the issuing of a bond. When they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So this was a pledge or a, or a, a bond, you know, bail. It, it, it's like bail. You know, Jason had to give a guarantee that Paul and Silas would leave the city and not return. Uh, and that may very well be the reason why Paul was unable to return to the city. Uh, Paul makes a reference in 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 to 18, that he was unable for one reason or the other to return to Thessalonica. And this could have been the reason. So this bond was now taken from Jason and the other believers. And what would happen if more trouble arose, Jason and the others would lose their money. And then Paul and Silas were now allowed to leave. And they released Jason and the others for lack of evidence. And this ended the matter. Now, after Paul and Silas, after they left, we know that the believers suffered more severe persecution. Uh, so in spite of this, uh, the Christians at Thessalonica kept on boldly proclaiming the gospel. And this is known from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, 
and chapter 3, 1 to 5, and also 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 7. Now, while Paul was still there, before he left uh, Thessalonica, Paul twice received funds from the church of Philippi. And we see this in Philippians chapter 4, 15 to 16. And until the money arrived, Paul supported himself with his own hands. Remember, Paul was a tent maker. And we see this in 1 Thess 2, 9 and 2 Thess 3, 7 to 10. And we move on to, we're going to head off, they are going to head out of Thessalonica now. They're going to head down to Berea. It says in verse 10, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who when they were come thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, examining the scriptures daily whether these things were so. And verse 12, many of them therefore believed, also of the Greek women of honorable estate and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was proclaimed of Paul at Berea also, they came thither likewise, stirring up and troubling the multitudes. And then immediately the brethren sent forth Paul to go as far as to the sea, and Silas and Timothy abode there still. But they that conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy that they should come to him with all speed. They departed. So that's the big picture. Now, the ministry in Berea we see in verses 10 to 15. This is the next leg in which the second missionary journey took place. This is in Berea. So they've, they've, uh, they were sent away immediately from uh, Thessalonica. They come by night. Uh, and the fact that their brethren were present shows that a church was established in Thessalonica because the brethren immediately uh, sent Paul away, Paul and Silas by night. So there's a church uh, in Thessalonica. But two of these guys, two, two of them, Aristarchus and Secundus, they're going to later on, we're going to see that they'll uh, accompany Paul in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. Also, uh, Aristarchus was one of the ones who were saved in, in Thessalonica. He'll also be one of the companions who will go to Rome with Paul um, in Acts 27, verse 2. And the fact that they immediately sent them away um, shows the urgency. Uh, and uh, this may also mean that they actually provided an escort for them all the way to Berea. And this had to be done at night because this showed that there was danger because normally people back then did not travel by night. Uh, it was not safe to travel by night. And they went to Berea. Berea was 50 miles southwest of Thessalonica on the Ignatian Way, um, east of the Thermaic, Thermaic Gulf. Uh, in fact, Cicero called it uh, an out-of-the-way city. Now, in keeping with his custom and, and uh, his principle, we see in Romans 1, 16, verse 10, again, he goes to the Jews first. So when they were coming to Berea, they went into the synagogue. And the Jewish community in Berea was large enough now to support a synagogue. Remember, you had to have a, a minimum of 10 men to have a synagogue. Now in verses 11 to 12, we see the reception by the Bereans. In verse 11 it is the evangelism that was accomplished. Um, it, 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 Luke writes that these guys were far more noble than those of Thessalonica, these Jews. Um, and so it means that they were well born, they were noble or noble minded. They had a generous spirit. They were free from prejudice, which made them uh, more open to the gospel. Uh, and their nobleness is described in their actions. What were their actions? They received the word with all readiness of mind. You know, Paul expanded the scriptures to them and the Bereans listened to what Paul was saying. The same thing with Lydia. Remember Lydia, when she, she listened to what Paul was saying, she came to faith. Same thing here. The Bereans listened intently to what Paul was saying. They didn't make any immediate decisions. Uh, they didn't make any decisions based upon their prejudice one way or the other. 
had an open mind. And so what they did was they went and uh, they are examining the scriptures daily. Um, it, it means uh, when it says examining, they were sifting up and down the scriptures. They need. They were making a careful and exact research, uh, as if it was a legal process. They were looking for evidence to support what Paul was saying. So they searched the scriptures out to to find out for themselves if the scriptures present themselves as Paul claimed. Of course, Paul's words were true because he was expanding from the scriptures. And the follow-up to that would be um, if what Paul was saying was true and the scriptures say so, then Jesus is the Messiah. Now, Paul had been overjoyed at the way the people in Thessalonica received the word, uh, but now these noble Bereans must have really encouraged his heart because these guys went and searched it out and worked out from the scriptures, Jesus was the Messiah. And in verse 12, it says, many of them believed. Uh, and see, it says, many of them therefore believed. What's the therefore for? Because they were careful students of the scripture, because they sought out from the scriptures to confirm or deny what Paul was saying. And because of what the scriptures said, they believed. And more Jews believed in Berea than in Thessalonica. And this included a man down here called Sopater, who later will assist Paul. He's mentioned down in Acts chapter 20, verse 4 as well. Now, besides many of the Jews believing, uh, because the Jewish work in, in uh, down here in Berea was far more successful than in, than in Thessalonica, Gentile women also believed. And these were of honorable estate. These were the upper class women, uh, same as those back in Acts chapter 13, verse 50. It says quite a few, uh, not a few, it says not a few of these Gentile women became believers. So there was also a lot of Gentile men because it says, and of men, not a few. So these again would be of the nobility. And many people in Berea became believers, both Jews and Gentiles, both men and women, because of the preaching of Paul. And in verse 13, we now find again the opposition. Once again, now Satan brought the enemy to the field. Uh, and the source of the opposition was, was what? The Jews of Thessalonica, those who were jealous of Paul's um, work in, in Thessalonica, they're not happy with, with what he's doing. And they come all the way up here to Berea. When they had knowledge that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul up here in Berea, Paul and Silas, they traveled all the way to Berea. And what did they do? They come down stirring up tro and troubling the multitude. Um, they were, it says they were shaking the crowds up like an earthquake. That's what the Greek says. Uh, they disturbed the peace like a tornado. They didn't just come in making a little noise. They come in with, to make a massive amount of noise. Um, and the opposition became larger and better organized because these guys were actually willing to, to travel 50 miles from Thessalonica to Berea for the purpose of stirring up trouble. So they were organized. Mate. This was a, a, um, you know, a paid crowd stirring group. And in verses 14 to 15, this now leads to Paul's escape to Athens. Now, Paul had to once again leave a place of rich ministry, you know, and then immediately, uh, and the word immediately shows a sense of urgency. Immediately, the brethren sent Paul as far as the sea. So again, the fact that we now have brethren in Berea shows that a church was now established in Berea. And later on, uh, one of the church members of Berea will accompany Paul to Jerusalem, according to Acts 20, verse 4. When the sea is mentioned, that tells us that they went as far as the sea and then took a ship to Athens. For Silas and Timothy remained behind in Berea to keep the work going. Uh, here, the, uh, as, as Simon was back in Thessalonica, the opposition was after Paul and not the other two members of the party. But they that conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. So, so these Berean believers, uh, they take Paul, they escorted Paul, not just to the sea, but they boarded the ship and they escorted him as far as Athens to make sure he gets to Athens safely. 
And once Paul arrives in Athens, the escort then returned, uh, they went back to Berea. Um, and Paul gives them a command. He says, listen, when you get back to Berea, tell Silas and Timothy that you need to get down here with all speed. And so uh, these, his escort went back to Berea. And they, they take this uh, command or this letter back or word back to Timothy and Silas to join Paul in Athens as quick as possible. Now, big picture. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, Silas and Timothy and Paul. Paul left Timothy and Silas in Berea. He goes to Athens. After Paul arrived in, 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 uh, in Athens, uh, he, he sent a message for, Timoth for Silas and Timothy to come down there and join him. They later joined him in Athens. Uh, we see that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, and then from Athens, Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. Uh, um, we see that in 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 to 2. And then Silas was sent to another part of Macedonia. We see that we're going to see that in Acts 18, 5. And Paul later on his own, he, near, he will go to the city of Corinth. Uh, we'll see that in Acts 18, 1. And then Silas and Timothy then return from Macedonia and they're going to meet Paul in Corinth. Uh, and we see all this from Acts chapter 18, verse 5 and 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. And then from the city of Corinth, Paul will write two of his epistles. Uh, Paul writes first and second Thessalonians from Corinth. Athens. And while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he beheld the city full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with them that met him. And certain also of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what would this babbler say? Others, he seems to be a, a setter forth of strange gods because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him onto the Areopagus, Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is, which is spoken by you. For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athen Athenians and the strangers sojourning there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now, Paul arrived in this in this in the great city of Athens. He not, he not coming here as a sightseer, but he's coming here as a soul winner. And these verses describe Paul's witness while he's waiting for the arrival of Silas and Timothy. And in verse sixteen. While he is waiting, by this time, uh, by this time, uh, when Paul was there, by this time, the, the, the long glory of Athens uh, was diminished. It was, it, was, it was still recognized as a center of culture and education, but its glory had, uh, had diminished. It was still the intellectual center of the Roman Empire. Um, it, it was actually captured by Rome, uh, uh, for Rome by Sulla in 86 BC. Anyway. What we know about Athens was that the city was given over to a cultured paganism, and that was nourished by idolatry, novelty. Uh, we, we see, we get, we'll see next week, or we'll see now in, in 1721, and their philosophy. <clears throat> and uh, one comic suggested that in Athens it was easier to find a god than a man. Um, that's how the city was taken over by idolatry. Um, now, Paul waited, uh, uh, and, and the Greek word for waited means that he was looking out for, he was expecting. Paul was, he was sitting on pins and needles. He was, he was waiting for Silas and Timothy to arrive. He wanted to get on with the work. And in verse six, second part of verse 16, Paul now sees the idolatry of Athens, and his spirit was provoked, it says. Uh, he was strongly moved, or he was greatly distressed. Um, yeah, as as um, as he sees a city full of art, idols, uh, um, what we see here is that uh, you know you got to remember that being a Jew, right, uh, 
a, a Jew had a natural antagonism toward idolatry as a result of the of, of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, so he was rightly provoked. He was greatly provoked by the idolatry of this city. You know, he, he knows what, what idolatry can do. He, he was mightily, stupendously, rightly, greatly provoked. That's what the Greek is by this city full of Athens, by this city full of idols. Now, the Gentiles of Athens worship these idols. Why? Because idolatry has ceased to be a, a Jewish problem with the Babylonian captivity. Uh, that cured them of idolatry. So it is these Gentiles of Athens who are worshipping these idols. And to these Gentiles, Paul was now provoked to preach the gospel. But as always, what does Paul do? He, he goes to the Jews first. So what did he do? He reasoned in the synagogue with Jews and the devout persons. And then also he, he would reason in the synagogue, in the marketplace every day with them that, who would meet him. So Paul would preach the gospel to the Jews first. Therefore, is in light of verse 16, in light of the fact that the city was full of idols, in light of the fact that Paul's spirit was provoked to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, he still had to preach it to the Jews first. And with his spirit stirred up in him, with the evidences of idolatry, he first uh, began reasoning in the synagogue. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons. And the devout persons were the Gentile proselytes of the gate. And he also proclaimed the gospel in the marketplace in the, in the Agora. And the marketplace here was in the heart. It was in the heart of the city where business, uh, both uh, the judicial and commercial was transacted. It was, a, it was a, the hub. It was a buzz. And around this public square were all the public buildings, the, the, the temples, the law courts, the colonnades, the shops. You know, it was a, it was a center of activity here. And he went out every day between the Sabbaths and he witnessed to the Jews he met there in the marketplace. Um, and Paul would not only witness to them, to the, uh, Paul would witness to those who would talk with him. Anybody who was up for a talk, Paul would talk with them. And simultaneously, while he's doing this in the marketplace, he's preaching in the synagogue. And at the other times of the day, witness to the Jews in the marketplace. So he's fulfilling the commission after the Jew first. Verse 18 he finally moves on to the idol-worshipping Greeks. And we're introduced to two types of philosophers here. It says certain of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. Um, yeah, two, there were two major philosoph philosophical schools. First, there was Epicureanism and second, Stoicism. And the Epicureans were followers of the philosopher Epicurus, who lived from 342 to 370 BC, uh, or 370 uh, to 342 BC. And they felt that the search for pure truth by means of reason was absolutely hope, hopeless. For them, happiness was the chief end of life. This is the Epicureans. Uh, today we knew, we talked about Epicureans being lovers of food, you know. Pleasure. For the Epicureans back then, pleasure and not knowledge was the chief goal of life for them. And they believed that the gods existed, but these gods existed in the eternal calm away from men. And these, these gods were never interfered with men's lives. They, they believed that these gods just lived in their own calm somewhere else. As for man, what did they believe? Man had no afterlife to either fear or, or to hope for. Uh, they figured that man needs to simply make the best of this life because this life is all we have. Now, while they claim to be the believers in the gods of the Greeks, they are practical atheists. In fact, uh, the Stoics call them atheists. And two famous um, Epicurean poets were Lucretius and Horace. 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 And their view of life in the course of time led to sensualism. And that's generally what they're most noted for, sensualism. Although that was not the way they actually started out. Now, the Stoics, uh, they were followers of Zeno, who lived in the third century BC. And they also followed a man called Chrysippus. 
They were called Stoics because they often met at the Stoa Apokili, which means the painted portico, and that was the porch where Zeno taught. Now, this is what Paul's up against here, uh, these Epicureans and Stoics. Stoic philosophy uh, taught that wisdom lay in being free from intense emotionalism. It meant uh, for one to submit himself to natural law. What they're saying is that man should conform himself comfortably to nature. And the highest expression of this, according to Stoicism, was reason. Reason would lead one to be virtuous, and to be virtuous means that you live in harmony with reason. And this is the only true God, or true good, sorry. And the failure to be virtuous is the only real evil. Other things such as death, pleasure, pain, etc., they were indifferent to them. And in their theology, the Stoics were basically pantheistic. And the purpose of the gods was simply to direct history. Man must align himself with that purpose. And so they viewed God as the world's soul. Um, pantheism was the worship of all gods of different creeds, cultures, or peoples indifferently. It, it, they were just there to be, you know, worshipped however. And they described the Stoic lifestyle. The Stoic lifestyle should be absolutely brave for pain and death are not evils. One should be unmoved by either joy or grief. So they believed in a stern self-oppression on the basis of human self-sufficiency. They believed in absolute contentment. Quite the opposite to the Epicureans, they believed that pleasure was not good they believed in absolute justice, weren't prejudiced by, 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 they weren't influenced by prejudice or favor. And what they did was they stressed the rational over the emotional in man. They stressed individual self-sufficiency, including the right to suicide. And in fact, two of their, their early leaders committed suicide. And they believed in a, in a, uh, you know, a, a stiff upper lip, you know, stern unending endurance. And this was a stoic lifestyle. And this, more than Epicureanism, attracted the Roman mind. Because remember, the Romans were in, into self, into, into discipline, you know, a, a good servants, good men, just take orders and do them. And famous Roman Stoics included uh, Seneca and, and Epi, Epi, Epictetus, and then one of the emperors, Emperor Marcus Aurelius. And so we have here in the, Areopag in the Areopagus, uh, these Stoics and these Epicureans. Epicureans said, enjoy life. Stoics says, endure life. But now it, it remains for Paul to explain how they could enter into life through faith in God's risen son. And in verse 18, we have the mocking of Paul. And some said, what would this babbler say? Uh, and the Greek word here is spermologos. Uh, as for babbler, it means a seed picker or a word scavenger. Um, and and uh, in a couple of other philosophers back then, Aristophanes and Aristotle, they use that word in speaking of small, active, carnivorous birds. Um, and Plutarch used it, uh, the word for crows, picking grain from the field. So what they're saying is like a bird picking grain from the, peel, uh, from the field, Paul was like one who took learning from here and there, and, and you know, he, he passed it on as, as his own. In other words, they're describing Paul as being an excessive talker. He, he just babbles on. He's got nothing really, anything decent to say. So the question was, what's this seed picker going to say? And this is a question that the Epicureans would raise. Others said, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods. Uh, and the Greek word for gods is the word uh, da daemonian, which normally referred to demons. But when the Jews used this word, it was demons. When the Greeks used this word, it was gods, um, either good or bad gods. And since Luke is recording these words uh, uh, spoken by Greeks, he's meaning it in that sense, uh, not as demons, but as gods who were either good or bad. Now, this, this same um, accusation was made against uh, a man called Socrates. The only thing with this accusation against Socrates, what they said was that he did wrong by introducing new deities. 
but uh, Socrates, Socrates was eventually executed for that. So Paul is in a position where he can lose his life here because Roman law forbid the introduction of any new religions. And, and this second response comes from the Stoics, you know, setting forth strange gods. Now, the reason that these two groups, all that history, the reason that these two groups came up with these questions was because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. They clearly misunderstood what it was that Paul was teaching, and they probably took it to be a strange religion. Um, uh, they probably took the term resurrection as a proper name. Uh, and in Greek, a resurrection is anastasis, uh, and they probably took this as the proper name anastasis or resurrection to be a new god that paul was now proclaiming in actual fact anastasia is a greek goddess in verse 19 and they took hold of him and brought him him onto the areopagus areopagus you know what i mean the term areopagus means the hill of ares it's ares is the name as same as mars one's greek one's roman uh, the word itself refers to Mars Hill. Mars Hill was northwest of the apocalypse, uh, uh, not the apocalypse, the Acropolis. It was about 377 feet high. It was the hill or the court of the god Ares or Mars. Ares Greek, Mars Latin or Roman name. But the word by Paul's day uh, also referred to the council of Areopagus. Areopagus. Are which met in the Stoa Basilica. And it was an important tribunal in Roman times. So what we're seeing here is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, this group was like a government group responsible for supervising the religion, the culture, and the education in Athens. So it had full control of all itinerant lecturers who were passing through and Paul comes along now, he appears to be an itinerant lecturer who was passing through at this time. But in Paul's case, it wasn't an inquiry. It was actually an, an inquisition. Like the question they raised, we see, may we know what this new teaching is, which is spoken by you? In other words, may we know or can we come to know this new teaching? Uh, and the, 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 the um, question here is prompted by sarcasm because no definite charge was laid against Paul as such. Uh, and, and the reason was, he says, you're bringing certain strange things to our ears. Uh, and uh, when it says strange things, it means things which are surprising or shocking us. Um, uh, and this is the same word used by Xenophon of Socrates. Uh, Socrates, they claim, brought strange and shocking words to them, and these words led to his death. They then said to Paul, we want to know what these things mean. Explain yourself. And now we have a little parenthetical statement here by Luke, because we'll see Paul explain himself next week. Uh, and Luke says, the Athenians are and the strangers sojourning there. So Luke remarks that they spend their time in nothing else. They spend their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Apparently, these guys had sufficient money that they didn't have to work, and they simply sat around waiting to hear something new or to say something new. It, it literally means something newer or fresher. Uh, they're looking for the latest stick or, or the latest fad. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for the latest fad to get themselves set into this new, this new, new, this new move. And, uh, and this is where we will end it today. If you need to contact us, there are contact details there. Thank you.